Thank you, Peg. This um, reading series uh, is, is really grown into something really important for writers, for readers, for and really for Marin. I, I mean, it's really sort of our scene here north of the Golden Gate Bridge, and we tend to go out afterwards, and I, you, tend, you always know there's going to be uh, great people reading here, and, and Peg has just done an amazing job of pulling the whole thing together, and it's been, yeah, really, really a treat. Um, you know, anybody can tell you when writers go out on book tour, it's it's a crapshoot. You know, you can end up with a decent crowd. You can end up with two people, uh, both of whom are related to you, and neither of is interested in what you're, you're reading. So, um, so having a group of smart uh, readers and writers in the audience is, is such a treat. So I'm, um, uh, I talked to Jason Roberts, who, one of the great writers you're reading tonight, and he encouraged me I've, uh, to not read from the collection, I'm actually gonna read something new. So uh, this has not been shared with the world, it's from a, a novel um, that's, uh, that's supposed to be finished late next summer, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but it's pretty rough, and I'll just give you the quick setup of it. It takes place in the year 1980 in New York City, and it's a family who's living in the building, the Dakota, you know, in the year that John Lennon is assassinated. The father is a talk show host, um, loosely based, very loosely based on Dick Cavett. He suffered a nervous breakdown two years before the start of, of the novel and lost his show. His son, Anton, who's the um, narrator of the book, uh, left to go to the Peace Corps and has returned with malaria. Um, and so I'll just read you a couple sections from, quick sections from the beginning. Um, and uh, without much setup, it might be confusing, but we'll try. Um, I hung out one night at the Oak Bar in the Plaza Hotel with an old girlfriend, Laura Mecki, who was living with a lawyer 10 years older than us. I got there first and grabbed two seats at the bar. The room was packed with bankers and young advertising types just out of work and a few well-heeled stodgy folks heading soon to the opera, and I caught snippets of conversation. Someone getting hired, another getting fired a boss who got his secretary pregnant. The man seated to my right asked the bartender to guess how many times he'd gotten laid in the last month. Twelve, the bartender guessed. Zero, the man said, but that's why I love you. <laughs> Laura, after she sighed and complained about her workday, seemed happy enough to see me and then concerned about my health. I tried to reassure her, but she seemed to be assessing my arms and face like a doctor might. We had gin martinis and ordered the fried shrimp and talked about what she was doing, about my time in Africa. I said I didn't want a job right away, or I didn't want a full-time job. I did want to make money, and I was doing short-term work. I had a job helping an old writer in our building with his memoirs. She had a theory about me, she said. I'd done so well at such a young age, I needed to slow down my trajectory. He was his father's assistant on the show, like did the pre-interview interviews all the way through college. Maybe, I said. I guess I'm in retreat mode. You're still somewhat good looking, she said, which was the way we used to talk to each other. That wasn't the worst kiss I've ever received. You don't look terrible in the moonlight. What's your lawyer like, I asked. She laughed. That's funny. How so? It sounded like you were asking about my lawyer and not my boyfriend. Do you have a lawyer? No, I mean, I have a lawyer boyfriend. He's good, she said, and then moved her finger on the bar as though smoothing out a crease. It's not overly wild or creative. He's solid. He's smart. I'm just not always sure we have enough to talk about. He talks about sports. He talks about money. He complains about the dirt and crime in the city. He thinks Carter is an ass, but he thinks Kennedy is just as bad. And you? I like Kennedy. Your mom's working for him, isn't she? Yes, I said. My mother told me about it. She said it's her third Kennedy. And there was something about that I found so sad. I mean, don't you worry a little? that if things go well, I mean, if he wins the primary, that something might happen? You mean he'll get shot? Well, yes, he won't, I said, though I've been thinking the same thing. I asked about her older sister and her nieces, who we'd babysat for once. She said they'd just watched The Wizard of Oz together. You know what freaked me out? She said, what, the flying monkeys? <laughs> Nasty fuckers, I said, I used to have nightmares about them. That and the cyclone. You know, they made that with a stocking, I said. What do you mean? The special effects man had a brainstorm. He strung up a woman's stocking and twirled it around with a fan, and presto, a cyclone. I knew this because I'd met Mervyn Leroy once at a party in our building. 
He told me other things, how the Munchkins all lived in a hotel in Culver City, and how they went wild every night like salesmen at a convention. <laughs> there were fights and Munchkin orgies, and the cops had to rush in almost nightly to keep them from killing each other. I told her how the Tin Woodsman's silver makeup almost killed him. Are you seeing anyone? She asked. No. That's hard to believe. I mean, someone who knows all you do about Munchkin orgies. <laughs> I've never actually been in one, I said. Or not when I was sober. Then I did something that surprised me. I put my hand on her leg. She took it in her hand and started stroking my wrist. You're so thin, she said. I know. I'm trying to eat as much as I can, but so far it's not working. I downed my drink and motioned to the bartender. When he looked my way, I tapped my glass and motioned to hers. He gave us new drinks and took away the shrimp plate. I heard you nearly died, Laura said. I could have died, yes, but that's different than almost dying. I had the deadly kind of malaria, but they treated me and I lived. What was it like? I had other things at the same time, amoebic dysentery, and I was getting a little crazy. I had hallucinations. Do you really want to hear all this? I do, she said. It was, I don't know, like a fever and like something much worse. I don't know if I'm completely healthy yet. I have trouble remembering what it was like to feel the way I used to feel. I'm getting my brain back, though. And what's it like being in this place? New York's got to look strange to you coming from over there, out there. It does. I couldn't do what you did, Laura said. I leave here for a week and I get homesick. Then she looked at her watch. I really should be going, she said, but she inched closer to me. I love this place, she said. You know they shot a scene in North by Northwest here, I said. Really? That scene at the beginning where Cary Grant has drinks with friends and he's called out of the room for a phone call? The bad guys say paging Roger Thornburg and he walks by them. They think he's their man and they kidnap him. That happened right here in this room. She looked at me for a while. You told me that the last time we were here, she said. <laughs> no, I didn't. But you did. You said that you were thinking of having yourself paged. I remember it now. I'd become in my 20s a repeater of stories. <laughs> I went and rented the movie the next night, she said. Can we get out of here, I said, and we did. Um, so that's one section, and then I'll just, this is a quick, just, quick description of where they live, and then I'll get out of here. The Dakota, where Buddy moved our family when I was two, is one of the most famous apartment buildings in the world. It looks like a Habsburg castle because, like the El Dorado and the Beresford and the San Remo, it was built to be one. The idea at the time was to build in the then remote Upper West Side of Manhattan, which resembled the vast plains of the Dakotas, said architect Edward Clark, a lifestyle to match what you'd get in a luxury hotel. The sort of place Marlena Dietrich, if she'd been alive then, would have been comfortable in. The list of people who've lived there or gone to parties is a who's who of the last hundred years of American culture. The old New Yorker cover, which had the rest of the world as tiny dots around a small spot of Manhattan, should have had as its glorious center the Dakota, because during the time of my growing up, it felt that way. Which wasn't to say it was a snobby place. It never felt that way. It was more like a European village in, say, Luxembourg. Open, friendly, grand, with stories everywhere, and the right people to tell those stories and to go out and live them. Not that I noticed that as a kid. When you're a child, you believe your experience is everyone's. Still, even at five or six, I recognized I was lucky, and maybe unusually so, that I'm sure, but I'm, though I'm sure there are other kids across the world who feel that way, and probably not because of a building. In the old days on the roofs, there were tents and awnings and gazebos, and on any given weekend, the parties would spread to the rooftops, and you could hear the sounds of people playing music all the way out to Central Park. We lived in an apartment owned by Boris Karloff, that has five fireplaces, once owned by Boris Karloff, that has five fireplaces and two kitchens. That's excessive, certainly, but all the apartments in the Dakota were like that, with high ceilings and amazing old fixtures, odd little touches you kept discovering over time. The roof, with all its gargoyles and gazebos and tents and awnings, was a world of its own. Strangely, the building wasn't that expensive for a good long while. It was on the Upper West Side, after all. And the Upper West Side was a fairly rough, rough place in the old days, with gangsters like Dutch Schultz and Joe the Boss Messeria, and scary empty lots and none of the glamorous shopping and restaurant life in the Upper East Side or Midtown. At the front desk of our building, Hattie Beckwith waved, waved us through. Hattie was from a small town in Ireland and worked the front desk for 50 years, receiving and sorting the town's mail and working the switchboard, usually during the days, but every once in a while at night. 
Who is the stranger? She asked my father and smiled my way. One of my former fans, Buddy said. Oh, listen to you, she said. He has your eyes. You need a new prescription, Hattie. His are brown. Oh, well, maybe there are. She always had a soft spot for my father. A lot of the building did. We had a party each year in the courtyard all around the brilliant fountain, and my mother would cook for days, and Buddy, he calls his father Buddy because his father doesn't want to be called Dad on the set, so <laughs> still calls his dad Buddy. And Buddy made some sort of pastry or brought out some good wine, and he'd sit at one of a dozen long tables with Rowan Rose and Benny Bacall and Jason Robards and Ruth Ford and Zachary Scott. In later years, John and Yoko would be there with Sean, and Yoko would bring sushi, and John would grab a chair at my father's table, and I'd go run around somewhere else. There's no need to be around the action, because it wasn't like the action would run off and leave us, until, of course, it did. And I'll stop there and say thanks.